Hey everybody, Moto America fans. This is Paul Carruthers. I'm the communications manager for Moto America. This is our weekly podcast off track. I do it with myself, obviously. It'd be hard not to. And then I also do it with, uh, with my partner, Sean Weiss. Um, Sean's in Ohio, I'm in California. And our guest today, I believe is in San Diego, but we'll introduce him momentarily. First of all, I gotta, you know, we have this weekly call. It's kind of our, it's kind of our content call. We also do another call that's like an all hands call where it's basically everybody in the company on a conference call and, and we go around the room and, and, and talk to each other about what's going on, what they've got going on and blah, blah, blah. So yesterday it was unfortunate, you know, everybody got a chance to talk and then nobody called on Paul, poor Sean by. So his, he gets a little butt hurt easily. So he was a little butt hurt because I guess he had a story he wanted to tell everybody. And, and, you know, before he knew it, we were hung up and, and on our way and, and little Sean didn't get to speak. So Sean, do you want to, you want to tell us the story? I mean, is it worth telling now or am I too late or what? No, I really do. I have a chemical need to tell that story. And it's kind of funny because I know you were, you were celebrating the fact that I didn't have to tell my story and take so long on the call to the inverse proportion that I was so, as you said, butthurt that I didn't get to tell the story or even be called on. So I was like, you know, it's like they say, it's like, it's like taking a piss in a dark suit. Um, nobody notices, but it gives you a warm feeling inside. <laughs> well, that's good. You know, and I, I do, you know, I know what it's like to be butthurt because I came in here on, I came in here on Monday morning and, uh, and, and I, the first thing I know, well, initially I was locked out, which didn't make me feel too good either, but it wasn't, it wasn't because I was fired or anything. It was actually because I locked in. So I'm sitting, I'm sitting outside and I look on the, on the wall and there's, there's these four nice stockings with the partner's names embroidered on them. And I'm like, oh, that's a nice touch. And I'm looking through the glass door and I see like everybody's got these stockings on their, on their office doors and, and it says their names on a nice little, you know, piece of paper that's all laminated and all pretty. And I'm, I'm trying to see my office and I can see part of it and I, including the door and there's no stocking. So I'm like, oh no. So I'm like, oh, it's gotta be where I can't see. It's gotta be there somewhere. Well, sure enough, I come in and everybody in the office has a stocking hanging on their door except for me. So I, I didn't know how to take that. Um, it turns out that it was just forgotten, apparently. But anyway, it so the wrong way. My, sure. point is, my point is we're, we've both been butthurt this week. So go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to try to uh, make up for that. And actually, this story um, leads into our guest. And you probably aren't going to understand that, but Paul... And our guests might not understand it, but I'll explain it. So anyway, you know, I, I've been thinking about this a little bit as an adult about things that happened to me in my childhood that I didn't, didn't really understand. And now I kind of do. But anyway, when I was about 12 years old, there was a four or five year period that every year at Christmas time, I would get a firearm. So it started when I was 12. Um, I got one of those little Red Rider BB guns when I was 12. And then 13, I got a 12 gauge shotgun. 14, I got a, um, no, I'm sorry. Uh, 13, I got a 22, uh, Harrington and Richardson man liquor stock 22. Uh, then when I was 14, I got a 12 gauge shotgun. And then when I was 15, I got a, a Remington 3030. And I still have all those guns, although they haven't been fired in, you know, since I was back when I would hunt with my dad and my brother. So I realized that I was going through a rite of passage for where I grew up, that it was something that apparently my dad, my, my dad's grandfather did for my dad when he was, go, you know, every Christmas. So dad did this and we didn't know, we didn't understand that this is what was going on. And I certainly didn't expect every year to get this. And I'll be honest, it, they weren't even things that I really even asked for. I mean, it wasn't like I was a big time hunter, or that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, the year I got my shotgun, um, we went out and we went partridge hunting, which partridge are also called grouse, but partridge are kind of a big deal in Northern New York where I grew up in, and you hunt them during this time of year, usually the late fall, um, when it starts to get cold, snow on the ground, things like that. One of the things about partridge is they're sort of related to chickens in a way that they don't really fly very far. 
their bodies aren't really designed, or turkeys, they're not really designed to fly very far. As you know, a chicken or a, a turkey can't really fly. They can fly for a little ways, and then they have to land. And that's the thing about a partridge. When you will go out in the, in the uh, woods, partridge like to hang out in bushes, and they would, while you're walking along, they would get startled, and they would basically take flight, and they wouldn't go far. So you, what you do is you would witness them taking off and you'd find out where they landed and then you would, you would, uh, you would flush them again in, in a way that you could get them up in the air so that you could essentially hunt them and shoot them. And so I used to be the one that would kind of go ahead and kind of flush these bushes and I would always be scared. I mean, any, for anybody uh, that's listening to this podcast that has ever hunted partridge, they'll scare the crap out of you because when they take off, they're so loud. I mean, it literally sounds like a V-twin engine taking off or something. It's like super loud and this fluttery sound and then it's kind of quiet again. And the reason I bring this up and the reason I was gonna bring it up on the call yesterday, our all hands call, is because that's the origin of the idea of beating around the bush. You literally beat around the bush to try to flush out you know, birds and sometimes dogs will do it for you. We had a dog that we had a dachshund that dog wasn't a hunting dog so we didn't have that so anyway long story short this the story that i did on the website this story about superbike where i was kind of speculating what might happen in this year all i was trying to do was beat around the bush a little bit and sort of you know make some educated guesses on what might happen there was nothing about any announcements that were being made there other than the people we already know like matthew skulls or jake gagne um, or possibly Bobby Fong. I mean, we don't, we don't know who's going to be racing in Superbike for the most part. Max Flinders, obviously, will probably continue. And I, I wrote about all these people. I even mentioned our guest, um, our podcast guest in the story as well, and speculating what he might be doing. But the point is, all I was doing was beating around the bush, and it turned into this thing where people were getting angry that, like, they thought we were actually going to divulge the entire grid. Like, we would even know that at this point and and then you know there were some some of the riders privateer riders that weren't happy that they weren't mentioned and i was like man i you know it's like the best intentions and it it just didn't do do so well so here i was thinking about this story about beating around the bush when i was a kid and it didn't like i said i i would flush out partridges but i would never be able to shoot one and kill one i've actually with all the firearms i have and the hunting i've done i've never killed a, an animal in my entire life and as i've gotten older um, I value pets and animals so much that I just, I, I couldn't actually do it anyway. So I have these guns that I guess they're kind of good for par target practice. And it was like this manly rite of passage when I was a kid. But the moral, moral of the story is this idea of beating around the bush. And like I said, the lead in is that the guest that we're having on today is one of the people I mentioned in, in this, um, trying to flush him out and see what he's going to do. So when we talk to him, we can, we can ask him about that plan, but Paul, thank you for letting me get that story. Oh, oh. Okay, uh, you know my takeaway from that story? So <laughs> is there no partridges in pear trees? Well, I think I think the deal is, yes. I, I don't think there are a lot, of, there aren't a lot of pear trees where I grew up because it's a, it's a they grow in more temperate climates. But yeah, I think that's the origin of it. I think partridges probably do hang out in pear, pear trees. And, you know, that's part, that's really not a bush, but... I, that wouldn't go Bradford. very well with your beating around the bush or right because you can't really reach them and honestly we have a bradford pear in our lawn that they're they they have a lot of branches in them so i could see a partridge kind of being sort of nestled in a pear tree and hard to see unless you you know shake the tree or whatever but but um anyway i just thought it was cool about that origin of beating around the bush and people not really thinking about what that might mean and that's literally what it means okay yeah. well now that we've lost half our audience let's try and get them back <laughs> <laughs> Our guest today is uh, is superbike racer Bradley Ward, and uh, Bradley is Bradley stands out to me because um, I see him all the time, actually, in, obviously in the paddock, and he it seems like no matter what he's he's always happy, yeah, he's always he's always pleasant to talk to, he's always got a wave and a hello, and this could be if he's having the worst day or the best day. So that kind of stands out in my mind because I, I always appreciate people that are like that. I, I envy them in, in a lot of ways because sometimes I'm just can, a grumpy little prick. But um, it's a good job you've not seen me for the past 10 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm getting to that. But anyway, so this guy, he, he finished 15th in the Superbike Championship. It's his first Superbike Championship, but that's not really... 
that doesn't exactly tell you the story of how he was doing because he was doing really well. He was, yes. He had a big crash at New Jersey Motor Speedway, Motor, Motorsports Park, sorry. He broke his femur. He broke his wrist. If you saw it in person or if you saw it on TV, it was horrific. And, and we're going to have him explain that when we get him on here because uh, he started to explain it to Sean and I, and I got queasy right away. But I, I think I can handle it now that I've heard um, Sean's story, which made me even queasier. So <laughs> he's the big happy Brit is what I like to refer to him at. You know, as I said, he's always smiling and and even smiling after he was hurt from, from, from videos and, and photos that he was shooting in, in, in for social media from the hospital. So Bradley, first of all, congratulations. Until, until the accident, you were having a good season and it was nice to have you in Superbike racing. You'd finished ninth in the Superstock Championship in the Stock 1000 Championship the year before. You made the move up to Superbike with David Anthony's team on your Kawasaki and everything was going well. You look like you were showing huge improvement from race to race. You had some crashes, but I mean, I, I'll, I'll be the first to tell anyone, you, you don't know how fast you can go until you start crashing these things and you have to learn by doing that. So unfortunately, the last one bit you kind of hard, but welcome to our podcast. And, and first of all, um, how's the recovery going? And why don't you tell us a little bit about the crash and, and, and the broken bones and the recovery that you've been going through since then? Yeah, it was um, it was a start to a good year, really. I was uh, sort of a little bit calmer, I'd say, than Stock Thousand the year prior. Um, obviously, I've not been road racing for a, a great deal of time, so I've been on a, um, a fast course of learning. Um, I think last year I showed a bit of potential, but made a few stupid mistakes and just tried to come into this year you know 2020 with a fresh start really a clean slate obviously I got the opportunity with Dave to to ride the ZX10 in Superbike which from the outside might have looked a little bit maybe rushed but it was the only option really that I had to to be on the grid and to be working with Dave and figuring a way out to obviously go racing and, and, and fund it um, and we made some good progress like you say weekend to weekend I was making my way up the leaderboard and getting closer to the pack in front of me. Um, and although we've got the two trucks, you know, we still had pretty small privateer set up. You know, there's Dave doing his thing, Sam doing his thing. We had a couple of transport guys uh, that were working out of my truck. And then obviously myself out of, uh, myself out of the second truck with just input from my dad as the main mechanic, really, and Ethan the young lad that helps me out. So to say we're a small setup, really, I think we were making pretty good progress and, and showing a little bit of potential until, uh, until the shit hit the fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, Bradley, that crash, I, I mean, we, we see a lot of guys crashing and it was a bad crash. We looked at it and, and it just initially it didn't, it, maybe this doesn't make sense to you, but it didn't look like you were going to, you had gotten hurt that bad or were going to. It was a little bit shocking that you got as badly hurt as you did. So talk about that. What you, I mean, obviously you were in the crash, so you knew you hit hard, but did it surprise you that you had what happened you did in terms of the damage to your body? Nothing surprised me, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I've lived I've lived like this for 24 years. I've seen plenty of uh, plenty of stupid accidents. Have you had you've never had a crash like that though. You you've raced a lot of motocross too, I know. Have you yeah, ever had a yeah, crash that like that? My, no, that was my first I'd say proper spill really road racing. I had a few little get offs last year on on the stock thousand but you know just learning crashes really just losing the front, pushing a little bit hard, a little bit too eager. Um but this is you know, this I'd say is the first big, big crash that I've ever had, uh, which is probably a bit of a blessing in disguise because it'll knock me down a peg or two. <laughs> yeah, wow. Um, but, but, but if you look at the video, you know, it is, like you say, it is a freak accident. The chances, I guess, of catching your knee on the curb like I did and it causing as much devastation as what it has done is, I've, I've never seen it. Um, so I don't know. It's uh, it's one of those things. I guess I could have prevented it a little bit. You know, maybe I shouldn't have been that close to the edge of the track. Obviously, I'm tall. I'm six foot three, and 
skinny and gangly, so anything that's floating around the side of the bike can grab the grass or the knee or my knee slider or whatever. You know, it's uh, I guess it's just one of those freak accidents that unfortunately I've uh, I've encountered. <laughs> now, now what I the part that I think is bad is what is what you told me this morning, and I already knew this, but that you you you'd suffered the injury or part of the injury before you'd even hit the ground. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, you know, I think that's what's causing so much aggravation with, with my recovery is if you look at the video of the crash, my knee slider on my right knee caught either the grass or maybe possibly the start of the curb and the grass. And that obviously ripped me off the side of the bike into sort of side saddle. Um, but my femur was already snapped at that time. You know, my leg were broke. Um, you, you broke your femur by hitting it on the curb with your knee? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, a femur, I say this all the time. Not all the time, but whenever anybody talks about a femur, people have heard this a million times. That your femur is stronger than the equivalent of concrete in that shape. Like, it's the strongest bone in your body. And you broke that hitting a curb. Oh, my gosh. Proper Yorkshire, man. Might want to think about some more meals. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you broke it and then you had to go through all that tumbling around and, you know, doing what you did to your wrist and all that. While the thing that, so your leg is obviously not to get grotesque, but the thing was getting banged on some more after it was already broken. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've spoke to a lot, obviously a lot of my motocross guys that have had similar injuries and the recovery time for the femur from a motocross perspective is a lot less than what I've had to go through I think because of the obviously the stability of the bone not being there when I'm tumbling it was snapped in half and obviously the leg were flailing around and wrapped around the back of my head a few times and it caused a great deal of damage to my hamstrings and groin and my quads and everything around it were just wow. battered really so, so let's talk about the treatment a little bit, just because I, I have a question I'm curious about. Um, initially, well, you, they must have put a rod in. And I want to ask you, I've heard this done a couple of different ways. They can go, they can displace your hip and go down through the top of your, through basically like your hip socket, or they can go through the bottom part through your knee. Which way did the rod go in on you? Um, the break was pretty much bang slap in the middle. Um, so they ended up going up through the knee, but unfortunately I've had a handful of knee surgeries. So it's caused a little bit of complications with some things that have been done in my knee uh, prior to this accident. Um, so they did end up going, you know, up through the knee, but it's maybe put a little bit hot, more on hold with the recovery just because of the aggravation around a pre-existing injury. Really. I was, uh, a bit shocked that they went up, to be honest, through my knee. I would have probably preferred it going down through the hip and I'm not have uh, disrupted something that's already been uh, taken care of. <laughs> mm. So was the, you also, the, was, is the wrist actually worse than the leg as far as healing? Uh, I, that's what I was concerned about. Obviously, the first few days was very traumatic, <laughs> you know, looking looking at the crash and figuring out what I've done and sat there in hospital and getting messages from people and then watching other, obviously a couple of other guys fill my spot, want a particularly nice, uh, nice feeling. Um, but yeah, that's what I was ma ma majorly concerned about was the wrist, but that's sort of taken over my leg recovery. Now it's uh, making good progress with a wrist um, and still just, trucking along really with my leg. Um, got a little bit of nerve damage in my foot, um, but nothing that should be detrimental for me to not be able to ride. You know, I should, uh, fingers crossed, should be uh, raring to go come the start of the season. Wow. So, so it looks like you're going to, your, your plan is you're going to start the season on time and, and uh, answer the question for us. Cause like I mentioned at the top of the show in the story, I, I mentioned that, you know, provided you, you heal up, you're probably going to be back with ADR this year. Is that what you're planning to do? And will you be back in super bike again? Yeah. Yeah. That's the, uh, that's the plan. Obviously it's a bit early now still to, you know, I've got another, what, three and a half months, I guess, until the start of the season. Um, it's going to give me enough time to potentially get back to fitness, 
whether or not I'm ready for the first round, I'll have to make that decision a bit closer closer to the time, really, I suppose. But um, definitely have the opportunity there to get back on the grid and I'm 100% focused on getting back. You know, it's, uh, it's knocked my confidence a little bit as far as seeing what can happen, but I'm uh, determined and I work very, very hard to do what me and Dave do. Um, so to not get back on the bike and you know get back in the swing of things, it's just not an option for me. I need to uh, need to get back to it and uh, show what 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 I can or what I feel I can do. What led you to switch from from motocross to to road racing? And did you come here initially to road race, or were you already were you already committed to road racing before you came here? No, the um, my granddad in the early. Uh, early fifties started road racing, uh, raced over the Isle of Man for 15 or 20 years and did a lot of the real road stuff. Obviously not short circuit like what we're doing, uh, over in Ireland and up in Scotland and over at the Isle of Man. And then my dad ended up obviously racing motocross as a kid, schoolboy motocross up until being sort of 20, 21 years old and had a few injuries and decided to get a um, production bike and have a go at a bit of short circuit racing. And then, Exactly the same with me. I ended up on two wheels at a young age, race motocross from being six to 14 or 15 years old, moved over to Europe and raced in Germany for three or four years, um, did some of the European championships and always had the dream and aspire to come over to the US and race supercross and outdoors. And that's what I did at 15 years old. I come over, moved over by myself for just over a year and uh, did a bit of amateur racing and then had a go at Supercross and unfortunately I'd, uh, I'd had a lot of injuries through my motocross career, you know, shoulders, elbows, four or five knee surgeries and it just got to a point where I was just in the vicious circle of getting injured and then getting back to fitness and getting injured again. So decided late 2017 I think beginning of 2018 we ended up getting um, a track bike just a cheap shitty R6 and uh, never ever ever had I ridden a street bike before nor had I had any interest in it um, did my first track day and sort of took to it pretty well from the first session and uh, ended up just following that career path rather than the motocross you know I'd got to a point where I realistically wasn't going to make it into that top 10 or 15 that you need to be in the outdoors and supercross to be earning a living from it so I decided to go supposedly the safer route and go road racing but obviously that's not um worked out quite as smooth as what I thought <laughs> I was gonna say go road racing son it's much safer <laughs> <laughs> you know um I've talked to, I think I might've mentioned this to you, Bradley, either this past season or the year before, but Ron Heben, who works in our hospitality and used to work with Yamaha, he was a mechanic for Mike Bell, Mike Too Tall Bell back in the day. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. And Mike was plagued by knee injuries because he was so tall. I mean, he went by too tall. And you mentioned the fact that you, you had knee injuries. That's kind of a product of being a pretty tall motocross rider. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, you look at any of the tall motocross guys, you know, Dean Wilson, similar size to me. Um, same again, he's been through various knee surgeries, ACLs, meniscus, and unfortunately, you know, being the size that I am, any of those niggly knee injuries, ankles, hips, your legs are always in the way. Um, and once you've had one of those injuries, you know, you're always on the back burner with getting back to fitness and trying to get back up to strength. It's, uh, you know, how it is if the doctor says it's six months till you're going to be fit and ready to ride a bike, you're back on the bike within four months and trying to get back up to the speed that you were left off. It's uh, a vicious circle. <laughs> yeah, you know, I want to follow up on that for a minute too, Paul, because uh, one of the things that's interesting, I didn't notice it about your bike this year, Bradley, but I remember the year before uh, this, you know, motocross bikes, especially now the four strokes, when you look at them, it's amazing how flat they are on the top. Now the transition from the top of the seat to the tank to the bars is, is almost flat. You kind of sit atop the thing and your bike last year, I distinctly remember your seat was built up so much 
that it kind of looked a little like a supercross or a motocross bike. You kind of sat on it instead of in it. Did you do the same thing with your super bike this last year? I didn't notice it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, part of the reason of the struggle for my first season was just how cramped I was on the bike. Mm. Um, obviously, been through all the knee surgeries that I have and the injuries. I'm not the most uh, flexible person in the world. Yeah. <laughs> in the world, so we had to make some adjustments with the rear sets. Um, Evol were good enough to make some custom rear sets and drop the pegs as low as we could get them and. Superbike was a bit easier because we did away with a rear brake and put that on the bar. So it gave me a bit of extra room for my feet and knees around my right leg. Um, and then I had to stick that big stupid seat on it to try and open my knee up a little bit. <laughs> it's, not the, uh, it's not the most aspiring looking thing in the world, but it works. It's distinctive anyway, you know. Um, <laughs> it looks like a Jerome's couch. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, so Bradley, you're obviously, you, you moved to Superbike. You, like you said, you don't have a lot of experience anyway in this. I mean, it uh, sounds like only a few years. Um, you're, so you're sort of thrown in the deep end and you're out there with these guys and, and there's a lot of, a hell of a lot of good riders in the series. Do you, do you, you obviously watch and learn when you're out there, but is, is there certain things that you notice that you have to get better at or that they do different than you that you need to adapt to? What, what, what's it like out there as far as just being a learning process? Although the speed and the approaching speeds and the braking zones are obviously a hell of a lot faster than what you are doing in a motocross situation, it's as if everything's almost in slow motion as far as you've got that much extra time to sort of plan, plot and think. You know, it's, I think it's a lot more of a mental game, road racing, as far as keeping you cool and letting the race come to you rather than being out there like a bull in a china shop and trying to achieve good results without really thinking about it. Um, which is, I guess, it leads into potentially my mistake from this year again. You know, should I really? I'm really good at starts. You know, you look all year. I've been sort of 10th, 11th, 12th place on the grid, and I'll be up to fourth, fifth place potentially into the first corner sometimes. You know, my motocross has definitely taught me aggression and getting your elbows out and, and you know, getting stuck in, but. I think there's a bit more to learn as far as sitting back and, and learning a bit from those experienced guys and potentially following them and, and learning a bit of the race craft rather than jumping in feet first and, and trying to be aggressive and, and make it come to me, you know? Yeah, and I noticed that. And, and I think bull in a china shop might be a bit mean, but it's, <laughs> also, it's also something I've thought of when I watch you. But I think that's a product of like, it seems to me like you have, you, you're, you, you're trying to play catch up because you started so late. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, and that's sort of that, that's sort of what I've said to myself as well. You know, the my enthusiasm and my aggression is sort of part and parcel of my quick learning curve. You know, I've had to learn now to be a national level superbike rider in two years of riding a street bike compared to guys like you know, Cam and Tony that have been doing it for 15 years, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot to learn in a short space of time. <laughs> you know, I used to, I used to t talk to Jamie Estadio about this a little bit, who was a, used to race in junior cup with us and has kind of gone back to motocross now, I think. And she came from motocross. She flat out said that she liked road racing better because she didn't get dirty when she rode. Um, you know, obviously you're kind of, you've made the transition to road racing and sound like you're going to continue with it. Do you, do you like road racing as much or more than motocross? Um, I got a bit burnt out with motocross, you know, I'd been that typical schoolboy kid with the uh, psychopath dad shouting and screaming at the side of the track for 15 <laughs> years of my life. You know, it's, uh, it just grinds you down, you know, injury upon injury upon injury racing 30 weekends of the year and it definitely gets a little bit monotonous um which were nice stepping away from that you know i walked away from 
from motocross with a bit of a bad taste in my mouth with all my injuries and obviously looking at myself as a not failure but not really set out and succeeded on what I planned to do. Um, so when I walked away from it in 2018, I didn't follow Supercross. I didn't follow outdoors. I didn't, you know, have any of the guys on social media. I just totally, totally wiped my hands clean with it. Um, and I really, really enjoy road racing. Um, probably more so now than what the latter years of my motocross career was just because, uh, just because of where I've got to in a short space of time, really, you know, it's, uh, it's been a good, good couple of years. Um, and obviously I've got intentions to, to carry on with it. As so long as, uh, as long as the body lets me, I'll be uh, back on the grid as soon as I can. When you made the transition from stock 1000 to Superbike, I think you ra you're racing the same bike, right? Uh, sort of. Yeah. Well, it's, here's, uh, what, I'm, here's but, what I'm getting at. It's the same bike, but it's changes. What I wanted to ask you is, I, for the for the listeners, I think a lot of our listeners understand there's some transitional things that you make to a superbike with forks, tri triple clamps, possibly uh, swing arm, things like that, electronics. Can you talk about what you did to transform your bike from a stock 1000 bike into a superbike? Yeah, the um, I think the superbike this year has definitely suited me better than the stock bike from last year. Uh, just how much stiffer everything is, you know, the the suspension, uh, we've got K-Tech in my uh, Cowie that I work really well with, me and Lenny get on well, and the setup's been pretty much non-compliance all year. I've listened to what he had to say. Obviously, my learning curve as far as giving feedback, what the bike's doing and where I feel like it could improve is not brilliant at the minute because I'm learning every time I get on the bike and ride around issues a lot. Uh, obviously, the motocross background, you I guess all motocross guys are like that. You know, you'd get on the bike and ride it regardless of whether the wheels are dropping off of it, the panels are dropping off of it. You just get on it, don't complain and do the best you can. So trying to get into that mentality of giving feedback and making changes, even when the bike feels relatively reasonable, has been difficult for me this year. Um, but the bike's definitely been a lot better for me suited as far as bit of extra suspension there to soak up the brake in. The brakes work a lot better. The chassis itself is a lot more rigid and stiff. You get a lot more feeling through the super bike than what I could ever get out of the stock bike. You know, the stock bike, you seemed like you could ride the front, ride the front, ride the front, and it'd just end up washing and giving. Whereas a super bike, you can feel what's going on a lot more so than what you could with a stock bike. Um, as far as electronics, the electronics on my Cowie this year have been exactly the same as what I run in Stock 1000 last year, just the kit Cowie parts that you can use in Stock 1000 um, with very minimal changes. Um, it's not like we're jumping in there every weekend and making different maps and getting into the complications that, that these top tier teams have. Um, we've just not got the infrastructure with me and Dave doing what we're doing and my dad mechanic in with Ethan. We just don't have the facility to, to be doing those changes or have the manpower to do it. So we've, uh, we've been on a pretty, you know, stable bike all year. It's obviously not the best bike on the grid. It's not the worst bike on the grid, but I can definitely go better on it than, than my performance this year. You know, the, the bike's not been holding me back. I've just been learning and, uh, progressing every weekend so fingers crossed we should be able to get back on the same bike again for when, I, when I'm ready a few different parts here and there we've made a few changes and uh, make some progress again. Now I want to go back to talk a little bit about what you're saying on the suspension you were saying with motocross you kind of learn to just go out and ride it for what it's worth but certainly I think the converse is that is there's a lot of adjustability on a motocross bike with regard to suspension and I'm sure you did a lot of that when you raced motocross. So you, you mentioned about Lenny and, and providing input. Do you, because of your knowledge of motocross, do you understand suspension? And are you able to talk to them about things like rebound damping, compression dampening, ride height, all that kind of stuff? Is that something that's kind of part and parcel of your, your lexicon and you can provide that to your engineer? Yeah, I'm pretty, you know, I'm not obviously the best mechanic in the world by all means, but me and my dad have got a bike shop down in San Diego. So I'm working in the shop during the week. I've done that 
since I was, you know, eight, nine years old. So I've always been around working on bikes and know the lingo and can, I've got pretty good response to how the bike works um and i can sort of break down a little bit of what it's doing and what i feel we do need to change um i think the problem is i get a little bit too deep with sort of telling lenny his job rather than telling lenny the symptoms of what the bike's doing and letting him make the decision you know it's uh it's one to be the rider but when you have that little bit of mechanical knowledge as well it sometimes I guess can get a bit confusing and then you end up sort of banging heads with my dad that's trying to suggest a change or Lenny that's trying to suggest a change. I think I just need to get on the bike, ride it and describe to them what it's doing rather than what I feel we should change, you know? Mm, yeah. I want to talk about the team a little bit too, Bradley. You know, we, I did a story this past year about the fact that it's the largest superbike team in the paddock with three riders on the team this year, but you had mentioned some other people, teams were involved. I know that Kalashine Racing and, and Low Tau's team with his son, Aiden, were out of your transporter too. So you guys kind of added more to it. So it's interesting because, I mean, obviously uh, Dave is from Australia, you're from England and the Tau's are from, I believe, Thailand or that area, the Hmong community. Um, it's kind of like the United Nations over there and it's a big, it's a big group, but what's, what's the dynamic like within that team? I mean, do you guys all talk to one another and, and what's your relationship with Dave, Dave? Does he, does he provide input to you? Do you provide any input to him? Do you guys kind of just, are you siloed and kind of do your own thing? Um, how, do, how does it work the whole, with the whole dynamic with that team and all the, all the people? We, um, we work out pretty well, me and Dave. I think that's proof of the pudding is, you know, We've had the relationship now for two years and he's seen some stupid mistakes that I've made and took me under his wing, obviously, from, from club racing out at Chuck Waller. Um, he's, a, he's a great mentor, is Dave. He's not the easiest guy in the world to get on with if you've not spoke to him before or he's never spoke to you. Chances are he probably will never speak to you unless you speak to him. Exactly, uh, yeah, it's very true. <laughs> But, you know, he's, he's a good guy with a shitload of knowledge. And for me, coming into a new form of racing, it's been, well, I can't, couldn't have asked for it to be an easier transition, really, because of the input that I've had from my dad with his racing background in, on short circuits. And then, obviously, been partnered up with Davey. Um, I couldn't have done it without him. It's been, it's been a blessing, really. Um, we get on. 80% of the time, there's 20% of the time where I piss him off and get him get in his way and slow him down or pass oh, him on the track. You, on the track, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Or in the truck, de depends. I pass him in the truck and he gets pissed off about that. Sometimes I pass him on the track, he gets pissed off about that, but we get on for the most part. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And I, I know I remembered from talking to Dave, he essentially discovered you out at Chuck Walla. I mean, that's, he saw you and that's how the relationship started, which is pretty cool for, like you said, with David Anthony, he's, he's a pretty quiet and kind of to himself person, but he's also a good businessman and understands the sport well. So he recognizes talent when he sees it. And I, I'm, we're so fortunate that he found you and that you're part of this paddock because, you know, you, you, you not only, not only your international flavor, um, but you know, you're, you're a great guy. And as Paul said, you always have a big smile on your face and Paul, I'm going to say it. We're also happy that you have Stacy in the paddock too, Bradley, that, that helps us a lot. So, uh, you know, keep that going. I hope that's still going on. I hope I didn't stick my neck out. You pig. She's smile. She's smiling here now. Oh, good. I'm well, I had to have a shout out to Stacy. Don, you <laughs> creepy bastard. <laughs> always, always. No, she's, you have always got a smile on your face when you say I've noticed that. <laughs> No, sweet girl. Good job hey, here. It's the only reason he visits your tent. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's it. I, I noticed this year he's been over there like a fly around shit well, compared I was to gonna last say, year. I never saw him at all. I was going to say, I think I actually didn't come over as much as I did the year before. I think I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just in awe. I can't even like, you know, so. <laughs> I, was, I was actually worried that if you stayed in New Jersey much longer, Sean had moved to San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> Roommate. <laughs> Anyway, it's, uh, no, it's been, it's been good actually. It's, um, I only met Stacey at the beginning of the year, um, and obviously she's been thrown straight in the deep end. With gone from being at home most weekends to been on the road driving in the truck and.
truck stop showers and staying in the truck and everything involved with going racing. So it's probably been a bit of an eye opener, but with the, we've, we've managed so far. Now <laughs> is, she a, is she a San Diego girl? Yeah, yeah, oh, we good. live down in Escondido. Yeah, is she is she native to, from down there? Yeah. Oh, yeah, she's been a few places. Uh, Ask her what high school we, she go to. Poway High. Poway High. Oh, okay, I went. To, I grew up down there and went to Patrick Henry. Right. Oh. So, right, and I also went to San Diego State. So, Poway High is full of gangbangers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. It probably wasn't even there when I was there, but anyway, I do wait my age. It's been awesome having you on the show. I've, I've kind of developed a little relationship with your dad with uh, Instagram because obviously my father raced at the Isle of Man and, and your grandfather and we've, we've shown each other photos and stuff. So it's, it's kind of cool to have that with him. And Yeah, ch ch chances are, I guess you guys might have been over there at similar times watching, uh, watching your dad's race maybe. Yeah, exactly. I was there from, you know, 66 to 71 or something. So I'm sure we might have crossed paths without even knowing it. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's nice to see those old photos and it's cool to have somebody in the paddock with a bit of history like that too. So, and it's also cool that you guys are in San Diego, which I always consider home. So I appreciate yeah. you. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. It's been it's been nice. I I wish you the best with the rest of your your recovery. And if you need anything from us, please don't hesitate to uh, to let us know. And you're only down the road a bit, so we can always help. Yeah, and I will. Um, got some commitments between me and Dave with the Supercross stuff again uh, with his second truck. Um, but I'll be there by hook or by crook somehow. I'll be at the first round, whether I'm working and helping out or riding. Chances are, I guess I'll be riding. I'm uh, putting in absolutely as much effort as possible with all this recovery. So fingers crossed I'll be there on the grid and uh, we'll see you, uh, see you then. All right. Yeah, we're we're going to look forward to it. We're going to look forward to it for sure, Bradley. Thanks a lot. Bye, guys. All right, mate. Have, uh, have a good Christmas and I will see you, uh, I'll see you in the new year. Yeah, you too. Give your dad my best.